Since so much of what we learn today comes from books and other forms of written materials, you're probably wondering how we're going to apply the visual memory techniques we've been learning to reading. This is a great question, and it's one of the biggest areas of confusion for most students. After all, it's extremely difficult, maybe even impossible, to generate visual markers while your brain's visual processing power is focused on reading and looking at the symbols on the page. This lecture will explain how it all works. If it's confusing at first, don't worry, because there are plenty of demonstrations and additional lectures on this process coming up soon. One of those future lectures will come up when we get to speed reading, and it'll explain in detail how you'll use regular intervals of pauses during your reading. This is not just because speed reading is very exhausting for the eyes and for the brain, but also because these pauses allow us to optimize the process of learning. Think of this as a sort of Adam Smith division of labor type thing, if you've studied economics, or if you've read Tim Ferriss's work, it's what he calls batching-like tasks. It's a very well-known productivity and efficiency trick used in factories and companies all over the world, and we're just applying it to reading. You see, just like there are at least three types of memory, there are also three stages or processes of memory. They are encoding, storage, and retrieval. Where most people get into trouble is that they try to do all three at once. Have you ever read a paragraph or a page of text only to realize that you've been deeply immersed in thought and you haven't actually paid attention to anything that you just read? This is what happens when you're trying to do all three memory processes at once. On the other hand, if you've ever studied process operations management or economics, you know that grouping similar tasks together is an efficient way to minimize waste. I mean, you don't wash one shirt at a time and then put it in the dryer all by itself. You wash all of your clothes together, put them all in the dryer together, and then fold them when they're all done. Right? <laughs> With reading, you've been doing it one shirt at a time, trying to multitask the washing and drying and folding for each shirt. It's just as inefficient as it sounds, and so we're going to separate it out into three separate processes to reduce cognitive strain and improve overall efficiency. Now I know what you're thinking. How exactly do we do that? Well, because of the limitations on your short-term memory and the inherent difficulty in multitasking visualization with reading, you'll be learning how to make short pauses of about one to two seconds after each page, or even take micro pauses of just fractions of a second after reading information-dense paragraphs. You'll also take longer pauses every 10 minutes or less to review what you've already hopefully put into the beginning stages of long-term memory. As we're going to discover when we learn about space repetition software, your brain needs to periodically repeat and review information in increasingly long intervals in order to remember it and prove to the hippocampi that it's relevant and worth remembering. This is similar to the idea that you must continue weight training to improve your strength and increase muscle mass. If your brain, like your body, thinks that the information you're using is a one-off occurrence, it won't waste the time investing the resources to remember it. In short, this is why we take small pauses after each page and much longer pauses of 15 to 30 seconds after each chapter to play back and retrieve our stored markers and perform a form of spaced repetition to improve our long-term retention. This also means that it's not a bad idea to spend a few minutes a week reviewing markers and ideas from books you've read months or even years before if you really wish to remember them. Don't worry, we're going to go into a procedure and a habit for all of that stuff later on in the course. But for now, you need only to be aware of this process and how it works. Before we can get into any of this, we need to master the concept of markers, or the quick visual associations that we've been learning about up until now. While we're discussing images and visual markers, it's worth noting that not all markers have to be visual. In fact, Smell is actually a more memorable sense than vision. Of course, we can't understand an entire book using our sense of smell alone, and so we're focusing on images. But if you read about, say, 
chocolate and you can conjure up the smell or the taste of chocolate, that's actually a great marker for remembering that data point. And if it works for you, even better. Whatever types of markers we use, whether they're visual or sensory or some other types that we have yet to learn about, it'll almost certainly be a mix in the end. This mix of markers, when retrieved and reviewed, reminds us of the details that we've decided we need to remember. And when combined with our existing knowledge and opinions and ideas about the content, it allows us to dual code and store information into long-term memory very quickly and very effectively. So instead of reading back over the chapter, we can retrieve all of the markers we've created and start thinking about how they're connected together logically. We play them back almost like a film strip in our minds and that helps our retrieval. It also, as an added benefit, serves as little landmarks throughout the page, which if we need an extraordinarily detailed level of information, like exact dates, we can actually go back because we have our landmarks of markers and they tell us exactly where we need to find that information. In time, we'll be learning to sight read, which will take visual information in the form of words and symbols and convert them much more quickly and efficiently into sets of markers that relate to one another and form a cohesive picture. We're getting there, but for now just be patient and keep working hard on your foundational memory skills like markers and chunking. Now that we have an understanding of how visualization can be helpful during reading, let's see how it actually works. In this lecture, I'm going to go ahead and read at a very slow pace and describe the kinds of visualizations that I generate and try to describe them in vivid detail. And then I'll be mapping them and I'll try to find Google images that somewhat come close to the markers or visual images that come to mind for me. Now, if this lecture is a bit overwhelming, don't worry. I'm going to explain how and why I chose the visualizations that I did in the upcoming lectures, and then we'll return to some practical examples and demonstrations. This lecture is merely here to provide a demonstration that we can later deconstruct together in the coming lectures. So for this demonstration, I'm going to use a Wikipedia article on the Garden City movement. Now, typically, Wikipedia articles are very dense. So this example is a pretty rigorous and challenging one, and it'll give us lots of opportunities to generate markers in a very short amount of text. So the first thing that I notice, obviously, is Garden City movement, okay? Now, I happen to live in a garden city of Tel Aviv, so I picture Rothschild Boulevard, which is a very green area, and I'm picturing a specific block and in front of a specific restaurant that I know where the trees are particularly vivid and green and full of life. The next thing that I'm going to notice, obviously 1898. It's actually tough for me to come up with a marker for that, so I don't particularly come up with one. The next thing I'm going to notice, you see these camel case and this link, I notice Ebenezer Howard. Now, Ebenezer is a pretty rare name. I only have one neural node for that name, and it's Ebenezer Scrooge, so I come up with an image of him. I'm picturing an actual image in my mind of Ebenezer Scrooge, which is familiar to me. You may picture the version of Scrooge that was in the cartoons you watched as a kid. Next, I notice United Kingdom. I actually don't come up with a flag of the United Kingdom here because Sometimes for me it's confusing with the other flags of the Commonwealth which all have that Union Jack symbol on them. Instead, I actually come up with a map of England specifically, but kind of an entire map of the United Kingdom. It looks like this. Next up, I see green belts. That's pretty easy. I come up with a green leather belt. And particularly, I see it on a pair of blue jeans, but a green belt is a good marker in general. Let's move on to the next paragraph. I notice immediately the word utopian. I immediately see a white marble city square with a big round fountain in the middle. I see this in very vivid detail. I don't really have anything for looking backward, 
but I kind of picture a guy in a top hat who's looking over his shoulder. Now I notice Henry George, okay? By connecting to existing knowledge, I realize that those both happen to be the names of British kings. And this works really well for us because it will remind us that Ebenezer Howard was British. And so I imagine an image of King George during the king's speech. I'm imagining, by the way, the father, not the son. Now moving on, for progress and poverty, I actually see children during the Great Depression and they're standing in line. Now let's keep reading. Garden cities of tomorrow. Okay, so I already have a marker for the garden city and so that comes up again. Now, if we keep going, I have 1902. I happen to know that there was actually a World's Fair that was supposed to happen in New York, but that was canceled. So I'm envisioning that a canceled World Fair would probably look like people rolling machinery and equipment back into a warehouse looking disappointed. Now, 32,000, that's kind of a strange number. Oddly enough, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that it's roughly 32 gigabytes. And I actually picture an iPhone 3GS because that's a product that comes in a variant of 32 gigabytes. For 6,000, nothing particularly comes to mind very quickly. All right, let's see. Six radial boulevards. Okay, that's interesting. I actually picture a hub and spoke, kind of like a wagon wheel, though... The one that I'm picturing has only six spokes. And radial is the word that I want to remember here. Now, for boulevards, I picture the planned community where I purchased my first home, which was called Boulevard. What else do we have here? What else do we have here? It's worth noting, by the way, that we have these images on the side, and these can actually serve as really, really great markers as well not to get distracted. We have a cluster of several garden cities as satellites. Okay, that's an important point. Now, for satellites, I actually picture a giant space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's probably a kind of strange example, but you might think of a communication satellite more readily. I have a very vivid image already in my memory of what that satellite looks like, so that's easy for me to come up with, and I just jump to it right away. Okay, let's jump into early development. Howard's Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Real Reform. Okay, Peaceful Path. I want to remember that because that's the title of his book. Well, I actually picture here an Israeli and Palestinian flag. It's kind of my personal marker for reform and peace because it's a highly emotionally poignant point to me. But you might picture an olive branch. Now, another one of his books, this is an important detail. Okay, Garden Cities of Tomorrow. Again, that same marker of jumping back to Rothschild Boulevard, but here I immediately, after this, jump to overcrowding and deterioration. Okay, overcrowding, that's important. I actually see a huge square of people pushing and shoving, and it's just complete chaos. Now, let's keep reading. I hope you're reading along with me. Working class. Okay, that's important. The first thing that comes to me here is actually someone in very dirty overalls. One of the straps of the overalls is kind of let loose, and it's like the overalls are kind of hanging off of his body. And I can literally see the dirt under his fingernails. Maybe he's a coal miner. I can actually see his particular hairstyle. It's kind of like someone out of the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? So again, this is a very detailed image that comes to me. You'll notice, by the way, that sometimes I skip over particular words or concepts like 6,000. I couldn't come up with something very quick for that, and so I just chose to make a marker for 32,000 instead. You'll also notice that I took very particular details. They're not generic or fuzzy images. So now I have Henry George in my memory. I have 32,000 in my memory. I have overcrowding in my memory. And all the other markers are there too. So now I just need to play back these detailed images. And what that's going to do is give me an overall picture of what was happening during the time that the Garden City movement was promoted. 
I now can deduct from the details to know that it was a response to overcrowding. It was a response to criticism from the working classes. And it was a response to the criticism that cities were becoming too overcrowded. Okay? I also know from my marker of 1902 and my marker of Ebenezer, I know who was doing the promoting and what was really bringing this movement to life and also where it was happening. Okay? I even know the basic principles of how garden cities are designed just by reviewing my markers. Now, let's deconstruct this demonstration and see just how it works. Just like I mentioned before, this might be a bit overwhelming just because it's a little bit advanced and Wikipedia articles, like I said, are way more dense than the typical stuff that you'll be reading. It's kind of like watching a gymnastics teacher do a backflip before explaining to you how he did it. So if you have seen how visualization works, that's great. We're going to deconstruct it and explain each component of it in detail in the coming lectures, and it'll be a lot less overwhelming when you do it with less dense materials than this Wikipedia article. Okay, you probably have a lot of questions and are wondering how you're going to learn how to do what you just saw. After all, what I just demonstrated is a little bit more advanced than where we are today. So let's deconstruct it and see how it all works. As you've likely figured out by now, markers are really at the heart of the entire super learning methodology. And for this reason, we'll spend a good amount of time understanding and practicing them in very nitty gritty detail. So what makes a good, high quality, memorable marker that can be easily linked and stored in our long term memory? Why did I choose the specific images that I did in the demonstration video, and why did I visualize them the way that I did? Well, first and foremost, good markers represent a concept, not a generic concept, but rather a very specific and detailed concept that can be easily retrieved from memory. For example, you wouldn't create a marker for an entire paragraph because there are likely three or four or even more clusters of important words or points in the paragraph that each deserve a marker. For this reason, rather than summarizing an entire paragraph with just one marker, you would probably do better to encode each of the significant details of the paragraph and let all of those details together add up to one summarizing marker. For example, I had the Garden City, Ebenezer Howard, the United Kingdom, and more. The more detailed and specific, the better. Ideally, you want to remember at least four concrete and related details for each summarizing marker. The next important criteria is that good markers are imbued with rich details. They're not foggy or generic mental images. This means that rather than picturing a generic grumpy old man, I pictured a very specific and detailed image of Ebenezer Scrooge. I can tell you what color his hat is, how long his beard is, and what expression he's making in the photo. We do all this in as much detail as we possibly can. If the details are given in the text, this will be very easy and it'll help you remember specific and particular details as you read them. However, even if the descriptive details are not given, you should create your own because this mental imaginative process will make the images much more memorable. So, what markers are sufficiently detailed? Well, first, in the first week of training with Anna, she made me physically draw them in my notebook. And given my drawing skills, there was not a lot of detail. But the beauty is not the key here, because if you draw something, it means it's sufficiently detailed for you to imagine it with clarity. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to draw it. The third important criteria of each marker is that a good marker can be easily connected to other markers that come with it. Now, we'll cover that in much more detail later, but for now, it's important that you understand that by using these highly detailed markers, we're able to remember more details with fewer memory points. It's a sort of chunking or compression of information because each detail encodes some of the information. 
An example of this is that my marker for Henry George happened to be a British historical figure, and my marker for Garden Cities was Rothschild Boulevard, a green boulevard in a real garden city. By selecting markers this way, we create stronger linkages or neural networks between each of our memory points, and as they're all tied together and represented by the details and the markers themselves. I want to point out that remembering the details as opposed to the overall concept is a very important point as well, because if we go from the details, like Henry George, poverty, radial spokes, and the UK, back to the original concept, we have no problem remembering the overarching ideas and concepts of the Garden City. But if I tell you the original concept and just say Garden City, you might forget the details. So we actually focus on memorizing those nitty gritty details and we can reverse engineer the overall concept and the meaning and the context from them. The fourth critical aspect of a good marker probably won't come as any surprise. Of course, you have to be able to easily and quickly convert into an image. With time, as you become more creative, you'll be able to convert just about any thought or idea into some kind of an image. But in the beginning, there are definitely some concepts that are easier to generate markers for than others. For example, if I read a paragraph that discussed the relationship of DNA to the study of genetics, which one do you think would be a better marker? You'll probably agree that we can quickly convert the idea of DNA into an image of a double helix. Genetics, however, is a much harder concept to visualize, and so we should probably go with the double helix for the overall marker. The fifth important point to consider here when creating markers is the differentiation between problems and solutions. If the paragraph you're reading presents both a problem and a solution, or a conflict and a resolution, it's always better to prioritize the solution or resolution, not the question. You'll note that I placed an emphasis on radial boulevards, green belts, and 32,000. Why might this be? Well, just like we chose to remember details before broad ideas, you can generally backtrack your way to the problem, in this case overcrowding, from the solution very easily. Oftentimes, the question is actually found in the answer, so to speak. If you remember the solution, for example, East and West Germany, you'll have a much easier time remembering where the conflict or the problem came from, in this case, World War II. The sixth and last element of a good marker is that it connects to existing information wherever possible. Just like I connected my knowledge about British kings, internet memes, and the city that I live in. Now, of course, much of what you learn will hopefully be new information, and so this won't necessarily be easy. However, it's reasonable to assume that a lot of the knowledge that you're trying to acquire is loosely related to existing knowledge in even the most loose or tenuous way. You may not know a lot about Napoleon, but you probably have seen a portrait of him with his hand tucked into his jacket, and even that minimal connection provided by using such an image as your marker is enough to make the information just a bit more relevant to your hippocampi. This, by the way, is why sensory markers like the taste of chocolate are so effective. You've probably tasted chocolate thousands of times and your brain knows by now that anything related to chocolate must be important. So there are the six things to keep in mind as you become better at creating markers. As we mentioned, you should try to create markers or a detail within another marker for every single element or detail that you deem important in the text. For example, people, dates, formulas, and events. But this isn't all. Typically, we have about two markers per paragraph with around four details each, depending on the density of the material and the length of the paragraph. This works out to be about 10 to 12 fully flushed out and detailed markers per page. Now, you won't always create that many, and during the first few weeks or month, you won't always remember them all. But that's not a big deal, because it's better to be mindful and to create all of these markers for significant details that you wish to remember. This way, if you forget some of the markers, you can reverse engineer if necessary, like we said before, 
assuming you've encoded in enough detailed information. Essentially, we're using the bottom-up method of remembering rather than the more common top-down method. All of this is going to take time, and you're going to have to practice for a long time to create high-quality markers quickly. You'll know your markers are improving when you're able to summarize and deduct the entire meaning of a concept or story simply by recalling the list of markers you have as a slideshow. Now, that was quite a bit to take in, and so let's review what we've learned about high-quality markers. First and foremost, high-quality markers represent details, not overall concepts, and we can describe them in one to two words. Next, high-quality markers are themselves imbued with rich detail, such as colors, textures, and so on. Number three, high-quality markers are clearly and logically interconnected to one another both backwards and forwards. Number four, high-quality markers emphasize outcomes or resolutions, not questions or initial conflicts. Number five, high-quality markers come in volume. The more, the merrier. And lastly, number six, markers draw upon existing knowledge wherever possible. Great! So now you understand how choosing good and detailed markers will allow you to reverse engineer a much greater overall understanding and recall of the text. In the course syllabus, you're going to start finding games and exercise that you'll do every single day as homework. These exercises will give you a few images and then swarm them in a bunch of other images and ask you to remember which ones were the original images. I want you to try doing this without markers or detail, and then try encoding each one of these images to a detailed marker or existing memory. If there's an image of a rabbit, think of a childhood friend who had a rabbit, and picture playing with that rabbit. Try again and see how much more effective you are when you carefully dual encode details and existing memories. When we read, a lot of the information we need to remember is, of course, the relationships between different data points, such as places, people, things, forces, groups, and so much more. Now, you might be asking yourself, can we really represent these relationships between each and every piece of information using creative visual markers alone? Well, no. In fact, the truth is that a huge number of our markers will actually be logical markers. These logical visual markers follow convergent thinking, meaning that they condense and put things together. The truth is, though, that logical markers are often so trivial that we don't even notice we're making them. They may be something as simple as a negative emotion of anger between Austria-Hungary and Serbia, or as complex as a schematic or diagram that explains all the interactions between all the different warring nations. Examples of logical markers can include emotions such as excitement, anger, or confusion, symbols such as question marks or exclamation points, arrows, X's, circles, and check marks, and even diagrams, schematics, or flowcharts. Which logical markers you use is going to be highly dependent on the type of person you are, how you learn, and what parts of the brain you favor, and so much more. Personally, I would never use a schematic or diagram as a marker, but Lev finds this technique highly, highly useful, and research supports the fact that logical markers or interactions between markers can actually be among the most effective markers of all. Personally, I rarely use arrows or other logical markers, but I do subconsciously use a lot of emotional markers to reflect the interactions between my visual markers, and in a way, these are also a form of logical markers. So, since some of these markers are not as visual and are often subconscious, how do we verify that they're strong enough or that we're making any at all? Well, when you start out, you can run the following diagnostic test to see how your logical markers are progressing. First, you can ask yourself, what is your opinion regarding this new find? 
Is it expected or surprising? Is it well proven or controversial? If you're able to generate an opinion, you likely have a strong enough logical marker to demonstrate that you've stored the logical connections behind the information. Another great diagnostic is to ask whether or not the marker creates further links for the same reasons. Logical markers are highly personal, and so it's primarily important just to be aware of what works best for you. From there, you can develop your own unique mix of logical markers to complement your creative visual markers, or vice versa. As our friend Malcolm Knowles would happily remind us if he were here, your success really depends on you using your skills and finding that they're useful in your daily life. If you don't believe that these skills are useful, you won't put in the effort and ultimately you won't get very far at all. And so it's only fitting that your homework is to try these new skills out with, well, just about anything. For example, next time a friend tells you a story or you walk into the other room to grab something, try creating some markers and seeing how much more you can remember. This is a really cool way to avoid walking into the kitchen and forgetting what you went in there for. Another cool thing is to try to use markers to remember the names of new people you meet. Now, we'll cover that in much more detail in the advanced topics, but you can already start imagining and inventing ways to adapt the method to scenarios like this and much, much more. For example, before you pick up the phone, try creating a marker of what you were doing before the interruption. It'll be extremely easy to remember what you were doing and go back to your workflow if you have that detailed, detailed marker. Eventually, I want you to create an automatic habit or reflex that anytime you're distracted or anytime you want to come back to a topic during conversation or anytime you're embarking on a new task, you create a marker. You wouldn't close a book without reflexively putting in a bookmark, would you? This is the same principle. I want you to create markers as bookmarks to remind you of what you are doing. The same goes for anytime you come across a new piece of information you wish to recall. From remembering to call your friend back to what street you need to turn on, you can create markers for anything and everything. Now the more you do this, the faster and more natural it's going to become, and that is going to make a huge difference. The beauty is that by having you practice markers before giving you all of the tricks and tips for adapting it to different scenarios like names, numbers, and formulas, we're also training your creativity and marker generation skills, which overall will make you much better at creating markers in the long run, even after you know all the different strategies for application. We haven't gotten to speed reading just yet either, but if you can get really, really effective at speedily crafting these high quality markers, it's going to be much faster and much easier to improve your attention when we do get to the speed reading portion of the course. So check out the PDF syllabus, do that assigned homework, and make sure that you're learning how to create those high quality markers. So now that you understand the basics of creating markers and you've practiced it a little bit in your daily life, it's important to learn more specifically how you should work with them. In the previous demonstration on the Garden City Movement, we didn't discuss much about how you should actually link your markers together. We've since explained that you should be able to describe the ways that they're connected using logical markers, creating a distinct relationship between them, and also that you should be able to play them back like a film strip. But let's take it a bit further. As we've learned, creating relationships and dense linkages between data points is going to make them more memorable to the hippocampi. And so it's important that we really learn how we can link our markers together more completely for long-term storage. As we mentioned earlier, markers and their sub-marker details usually come in chunks, whether by paragraphs in a piece of text or by the logic that connects them together. This means that sometimes you might not chunk the details in order for example, if a topic is discussed at length, you may take the final detail, which answers the question, and chunk it together with some of the information given at the outset of the page or chapter. Now that you've practiced chunking, 
you'll be able to easily see how you can group markers together by different possible logical chunks. Let's illustrate this with a particularly tricky example, the grocery store. Suppose you need to go to the local store and buy 20 random items. By now, you know well enough that you need to create 20 markers, one for each of these important items. But how do you link those items together to ensure that none of them are that single unconnected memory that drifts off into the sea of your mind? Well, if you're lucky, they're all going to be used into one meal and you can chunk them either by the side dish or the entree that they'll be used in. But for the sake of demonstration, let's say that you're not lucky. Let's imagine that they're just items you need to buy for your weekly shopping and none of them have any immediate logical relation to any of the others. Later on in the course, when we talk about memory palaces, we're going to explain how you can connect lots of completely random pieces of information, like a deck of cards or a random string of numbers, very quickly and effectively to a physical space or location you already have memorized. But for now, let's think about several other powerful strategies for remembering the 20 markers or items on your grocery list. In one example, you can divide or chunk the list items into departments. Milk products, such as milk, cheese, and yogurt. Meat products, three sorts of sausage, chicken breast and steak, and so on. This would be like a tree data structure, similar to how mind maps work if you're familiar with those. You could then try to visualize the packages you get at each department. Since each package is below seven items, you should be able to recall the visual image per department with great detail. As we mentioned, this is a lot like a memory palace, but you don't have to worry about all that just yet. Alternatively, since this list doesn't have a story or logical flow the way a text you read generally would, you could build your own story and visualize a sort of animation of your mother milking a cow and preparing cheese from the milk, and then throwing in some jam to make yogurt instead since your niece has a sweet tooth. Imagine that your niece is missing three teeth, which makes it difficult for her to bite off a chunk of sausage. Then your niece laughs, calls your mother a chicken breast, runs away, and falls. At the end of the story, your mother puts a frozen steak on the bump on her head. Now, this is a completely ridiculous story, but it's so ridiculous that you're not likely to forget it anytime soon. Of course, in general, we hope that the information you read will be interesting enough that the original logical structure of the text will be sufficient to link your markers together. So you can imagine Ebenezer Howard looked like Ebenezer Scrooge and picture him designing his hub and spoke garden city on a piece of paper with a book by Henry George who looks like King Henry from The King's Speech on the cover. And that book is sitting on the table next to him. This is a specific chunk of markers which forms what we could call a compound marker. In another chunk, you can imagine him drawing out the diagram with blocks of 32,000 people by pretending he had a 32 gigabyte iPhone on the table with him, and essentially you're using your existing logical markers and connections to chunk all the markers together exactly as they appear in the text. Amazing, isn't it? But what if the content isn't logical or connected or interesting enough, even in a written text? If, for example, you were memorizing all the bones in the wrist. They may not seem to have such logical and neat relationships between the markers that you might hope for. For convenience sake, let's imagine that everything we now know about garden cities is just a random series of facts. How could you package all of our different markers? Well, if we were forced to connect all of these existing markers without the logic of the text, we might get something like this. Ebenezer Scrooge and King Henry VIII riding in an overcrowded carriage with radial wheels through King George's Green Garden on the way to their 1902 World's Fair. Now that one image contains seven markers from the last lecture, all chunked together in an easy to remember story. You see, all we have to remember is this one compound package of markers, and we remember seven very specific details about the Garden City movement. Again, we do hope that you'll be able to use the logical markers and inherent connections 
between your markers to chunk them together into compound markers and link them into a logical flow. But, as you can see, any set of markers can be chunked and linked with enough creativity. Whichever way you do it, by linking these markers in a quick and dirty way into a vivid, memorable story or a set of chunked compound markers in the first example, you've been able to recall many more markers than you would if you had just made a simple list. Eventually, you should be able to use the different methods of remembering different kinds of information depending on how well it's logically connected in the text. As a rule, your list should be chunked at around four to seven objects just to be on the safe side, but you can always have subchunks or details within the markers that contain three to four more pieces of information per marker if the information is particularly dense. As an example of this, a submarker detail might be picturing Ebenezer Scrooge with a green belt if we determine that that particular detail was relevant. Again, we'll go into more detail about this later, but keep in mind that almost every text we read is organized in a similar structure by the internal logic of the text. The text is divided into sections, a section is divided into paragraphs and chapters, paragraphs are divided into sentences, and so on. For this reason, it's important that you never try to memorize or link a marker outside of its context if you're using this hierarchical structure. The marker should be remembered within a package or a story interconnected to the other markers in a specific and logical area of the text. This is a bit overwhelming, I know, but bear with me. When you try to remember a list, you should visualize the first and the last item in the list in more detail than the other markers. I bet you already know why. That's right, because this will allow you to reverse engineer any details that you happen to forget. Furthermore, you'll be able to recreate the story both from the beginning and from the end. It's a good idea to practice doing this, actually. Don't spend too, too much time imagining your middle markers. As long as you have a unique mental animation to connect these markers to the markers before and after, like my image of Ebenezer Scrooge sketching with the book on his table. When you visualize such a package marker, the whole package appears as one marker, one compound marker, with each item within the package as a detail or a detail marker. So our overall marker, and you'll have to imagine this because there's no way I could find it on the stock image website, could be Ebenezer Howard's study where he worked on designing the Garden City whereas a detail would be the book by Henry George on the table, the radial drawing on his desk, and an overcrowded and poor crowd outside his window or by the green belt on his waist. By the way, take note of that logical marker I've created by putting Henry George's book on the table. That logical marker actually shows that Ebenezer Howard was inspired by his work. Pretty cool, right? When making package markers, try to avoid inserting information that was not originally in the text because these techniques are powerful and you'll likely remember that information as well. So it probably wasn't a great idea to add that carriage to my earlier example unless I'm sure that I won't forget that the radial wheels are actually what matters. We really want to make the recall process as simple and non-ambiguous as possible. It's important that you experiment with the different ways of chunking and packaging markers and different levels of ridiculous markers to determine what's a good fit for you. These tricks of linking and chunking markers will make huge improvements to your ability to retain the markers long term. However, for material that you need to memorize with near 100% efficiency, you can refer to the advanced lecture on memory palaces towards the end of the course. So now we understand how we can link up the markers of new information. We haven't gotten to speed reading yet, but already we've greatly improved our comprehension and retention of the information that we read. For now, I don't want you to worry about doing all of this great stuff while you actually read. Instead, I want you to read and understand the information as you normally would, and then take a break when you reach the end of an idea to think about the markers you would choose and how you would link them. 
We'll dive more into the process flow and timing of marker creation when we dive into speed reading. Now, in the advanced sections of the course and in the exclusive masterclass lectures, we're going to show you some very specific and concrete techniques that you can use in order to apply the concept of markers to anything you might want to learn in or out of a book. In fact, in the next lecture, we're going to put it all together and learn how to link markers from information that we've read. But for now, we want to give you some examples and demonstrations in this lecture to show you how to create and link markers using the marker technique and to demonstrate how the marker technique can be used for anything you learn from facts to geography to people's names and so much more. These examples should help you see the types of markers we hope you'll be making as you begin to practice and apply the technique. To make this fun and interesting, we've used Google's random fact generator to stir up some interesting tidbits of information. By the way, if you ever want to practice learning random stuff, I highly recommend trying out this awesome tool. So have you ever wondered which country has the most borders? Well, neither have I. But now that I mention it, I bet you're curious. It turns out it's China with 14 bordering countries. Here are some different ways I could remember this. First, I could picture a map of the world, but picture China maybe as a 14-sided polygon. That's not so interesting, though. And how am I supposed to remember that it has 14 sides, not 7 sides? No, that won't work. But how about picturing a Chinese-looking emperor with a long, wispy, Chinese mustache and goatee. That's an image that is already linked to China for me, except instead of having normal proportions, our emperor has seven arms on the left and seven arms on the right for a total of 14 arms. These arms are each pushing away a foreign country, symbolized by something that reminds me of that country. If I wanted to remember that the number is seven per side, I could give the emperor a red outfit, which is a subtle detail to remind me that the number is lucky because it connects to my existing knowledge of red being a lucky color in Chinese culture and seven being my lucky number. Not a bad way to link up markers and existing knowledge, right? Now, if I wanted to then remember each of the 14 countries, I could create a submarker of each one and break them into chunks by region. There are a few ways to form these chunks depending on how I think of the different countries. I could chunk them together in all of the stan countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan. Likely my markers would either be the flag if I can recognize the flag easily or silly markers of someone I know named Stan doing activities like packing, knitting an afghan and so on. Stan Lee would be a great person to fit in here because he comes to mind immediately. I could make a nice big chunk out of the former Soviet states. I could chunk by places with a history of international military conflict, for example, Russia, Mongolia, Pakistan, India, and Vietnam. Any existing knowledge, no matter how politically incorrect, works. You can even create chunks based on the complexion of the average citizen. These markers are only for you, so it's okay to have inappropriate, silly, or offensive thoughts. In fact, it's encouraged. Someone from Bhutan might be offended that the only marker I could think of for his country was a boot. Someone from Vietnam might be offended that my marker for Vietnam is an assault rifle, but if I weren't standing here explaining it to you, they wouldn't really need to know about it. Still, my apologies if I've offended any of you. <laughs> In any case, do notice how each detail itself becomes a sub-marker or a detail marker which is carefully linked into the central marker of our Chinese emperor. Everything from the coat he's wearing to what his arms are doing is a linked marker. Remember this because pretty soon we're going to do this with the detail markers we've accumulated during reading. And pretty soon, you'll be able to do it extremely quickly, even faster than I've done here. Okay, that was pretty fun. Let's try another random piece of information. Here's one that I've actually wondered before. How do fish get water out of oxygen? Well, first, here's the answer. 
Gills are feathery organs full of blood vessels. A fish breathes by taking water into its mouth and forcing it out through the gill passages. As water passes over the thin walls of the gills, dissolved oxygen makes it into the blood, travels to the fish's cells. Okay, cool. Come on, this one's easy, right? By now, I know you all pictured a silly looking fish with bird's feathers for gills, right? Now, did you also picture a lot of blood vessels weaved into those feathers? Or how about an arrow or some other kind of logical marker going from the mouth through the gills? This is a nice example because it demonstrates how the details of the markers themselves become markers that represent significant pieces of information. All right, one more. Let's make it a little bit tougher. Google is giving us, oh boy, this is a tough one. What is Eric Blair's pen name? That's because when I read the question, it's really tough. I actually have no idea who the heck Eric Blair is. Fortunately, as I keep reading, I realize that, oh, he was George Orwell. This immediately generates some interest because even though I've read some of his works, I had no idea that George Orwell used a pen name. Now, you may or may not have read Orwell's famous book, 1984, but you almost certainly have some idea of what it's about. And even if you don't, you've probably seen the Apple ad from 1984 that makes fun of IBM by suggesting that they're just like Big Brother from Orwell's book. In that case, this is really easy. I picture all of those people marching towards the big screen, just like in the ad, except in the corner, there's someone huddled up crying into a camcorder about how scary the whole scene is. That's right, you guessed it. I linked it to Blair Witch Project because that was the first and easiest visual association and image that I had with the name Blair. To make sure I know that the first name is Eric, the person holding the camera might be my cousin Eric or anyone else I know with that name. Suddenly, this is a pretty easy piece of information, even if I haven't read 1984, to connect to my existing knowledge. Now, did you see how I created an overall marker comprised of animated, action-packed submarkers, each representing a significant detail about the piece of information? Now that we've seen how all this works, let's try it out with a written test. This is the culmination of everything that we've learned because now we are going to try it all out and put it all together with reading an actual text. So let me go ahead and read you a text that you've already read just so the content is not distracting because the focus here is on the markers and on the linking. So you've seen this already during your baseline reading speed and comprehension quiz. Now, as I read it, I'm actually going to show you the markers I create as I go along, and then I'll take brief pauses and explain them wherever necessary. So let's get started and try to follow along with me with the text. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the state and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Okay, now inside this image that I've put up here, I add details to the markers that are gonna give me, well, the details themselves are markers, but those details within are gonna give me a better understanding. So the planes that are doing the bombing and the kamikaze planes, those are Japanese planes and they actually have flags of Japan on them and the boats actually have American flags. And if I wanted to encode the detail that it was December 7th, 1941, well, I could picture that some of the people on the boat were preparing for Christmas celebrations. They're wearing Santa hats and, you know, it was supposed to be a lucky day, the lucky number seven, but instead it was not. Okay, let's continue reading. The United States was at peace with that nation and, at the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Okay, so here it's pretty quick to come up with a symbol for peace. I showed you earlier in the course that mine was 
the Israeli-Palestinian flag, but you can also come up with an olive branch, or in this case, I like just using the simple peace symbol because I don't need to remember anything else except peace, and then I can overlay that onto a map of the Pacific. And that can say, it can show me that at that time, there was peace in the Pacific. That's all I really need to know about all of that last sentence. All right, let's go back. Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleague delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. And while this reply stated that it seemed useless to continue the existing diplomatic negotiations, it contained no threat or hint of war or of armed attack. Okay, there's a lot here. So first off, I picture a message that's arriving to an army base. And it's already been bombed. The army base has already been blown up. And so everyone is sitting in a bunker and they're reading the message, but it's too late. The people are shocked and they're looking for some hint of war in the message and they're not finding it. So they're scratching their heads. Now, this could be the main marker of this entire paragraph because that's really the most important point that's been made here, that there was a one hour delay Otherwise, the people would still be on the deck, or if it was a longer delay, they wouldn't be, you know, they still wouldn't be there waiting for messages. And it combines the logical cause effect of the bomb that drives people into the bunker to receive the message. So really, we can actually summarize almost this entire thing with the marker of the people in the bunker receiving the message. The only reason you maybe wouldn't want to is if you need to remember December 7th, but just from the people being in the bunker and being surprised, you already know that there was peace because otherwise they wouldn't be surprised. If they were at war, they would have been in the bunker all day. Okay? So it will be recorded that the distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the intervening time, the Japanese government has deliberately sought to deceive the United States by false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. Okay, there are a couple things here that come up. First, pretty quick marker to come up with Hawaii, Japan distance. Really fast, really easy. During the interv intervening time, deliberately sought to deceive. Well, you can picture someone with their fingers crossed behind their back. And those are really quick markers. Probably I would emphasize because of cause and effect. See, the distance means that the net effect is that they were deceiving. So I would probably remember the deception, the fingers crossed behind the back. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. Here, for lives lost, we can actually use the same marker. Our takeaway is probably going to be deception, but we can use the same marker that we used earlier of the bombings. Okay? This is, by the way, the outcome. It's the result of that deception. So even if we remember just that overall marker, that's still a really good marker. As we've said, cause and effect, you want to remember the outcome. Okay? Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Japan has therefore taken, undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. All right. There's a lot of details here. It's unlikely that you would want to remember all those details, but maybe you do. And again, because this is a speech, it's a little bit condensed, but what I would probably do is create a compound marker here. I would picture a map of Southeast Asia or of all of Asia, and then over each of these countries that he's mentioned, I would just create a little animation of a bombing. Okay, I have a little explosion going up. And then when I pause after this paragraph, and I review that marker, I have a little explosion over the Philippines, a little explosion over Malaya, Malaysia, 
I have a little explosion over Hong Kong, over Guam. So that compound animated marker is going to remember or help me remember what each of the countries were that was bombed. Again, I'm not sure you would want to remember all of those, but you could if you wanted to using that marker. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. Okay, there's almost nothing in there that I would need to remember. As commander in chief of the army and navy, I've directed that all measures be taken in our defense. Okay, commander in chief, the first image I go to is an image that I already have in my mind, which is George Bush uh, in a fighter pilot outfit. And this is because George Bush was commander in chief. For those of you who don't know, in the United States, the president is commander in chief of the army and navy in addition to his political roles. And George Bush was a very militarily active president. I mean, he put us in Iraq, he put us in Afghanistan. So he's my marker for a commander in chief, as you can imagine. Okay. But we will, our whole nation, remember the character of the onslaught against us, okay? No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through absolute victory. Again, there's not a lot of, there's not information here. These are statements, they're opinions, but this isn't stuff that I really need to remember so vividly, so no markers. Uh, I believe that I interpret the will of Congress and the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but we will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Hostilities exist. Okay, now that we'll defend ourselves to the uttermost. That's important. That probably tells a little bit about the position of the United States right now. They're being the defender, not the offender. I do want to remember that. So I come up with a marker of defense and my marker defending from an attack as someone who lives in Israel comes as the Iron Dome missile defense system, which shoots down rockets. So probably what I would do is I would picture one of those missile defense systems, which I've seen in person and which has defended, you know, my neighborhood. I would picture it maybe in Oahu. I would maybe picture it next to the White House, uh, you know, shooting down rockets and remember that that is, that is the marker for defense and that in this position, the United States is in defense, okay? There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us, God. Okay, inevitable triumph. You know, the first thing I came to was the, and pardon my pronunciation, the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. And that's a nice one because it also helps me remember military conflict because I, one of the most vivid images I've ever seen of it is during the occupation of France, which was also during World War II. And I have an image of Hitler posing in front of it. So that's a nice linked marker. It links to the idea of triumph. It links to the idea of a nation being at threat. The US is right now at threat, like France was at threat. It links to the idea of World War II. And it, it really just goes to show the sentiment of the Americans right now. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, again, we can review our first marker for dastardly attack on December 7th, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. So now all we have to do is scroll through and review our markers and we'll get a pretty clear story of what has happened, okay? So let's play the markers back and let's review what we've seen. Japan attacked. Okay, here's our marker. They did so during Peace in the Pacific. By the way, December 7th, 1941. We know that because people were getting ready for Christmas in that first marker. They did so during Peace in the Pacific. There was a delay in the message. The distance of the two countries shows pre-planning and deliberate deception by Japan. There was damage to American ships and American lives lost, again, our first marker. 
They also attacked lots of other countries in Southeast Asia. We know that because of our animated marker here. As commander in chief, we will do whatever we need to defend ourselves. Okay, there's our marker for defense, great. We will come out triumphant, even though our territories are at risk right now. We know that, okay, great. But for now, we're at a state of war. Now, we didn't set a marker for state of war, but probably the marker that I would have done during state of war would have been the, actually, during state of war, we have to think that this is a state of war with an Asian country. So probably the marker that I would have come up with if I hadn't been distracted would have been the cover of the movie or the poster of the movie Full Metal Jacket because there's a scene when he's in Vietnam and I know Japan is not in Vietnam but a state of war during that movie where his helmet says war is hell and I remember him talking about that helmet and I remember him kind of being questioned by his commander so that's my marker for state of war. Okay, so by reviewing all these markers and playing them back we're able to essentially, really in seconds, I mean, it took a long time to explain that after the fact, but in seconds, you could review all of those markers and get so much vivid detail, and you see the interconnections between the markers. So a lot of our markers reference World War II. A lot of our markers reference that the commander-in-chief is a president. You know, we have lucky December 7th and Christmas built into our core marker, and all of this stuff allows you to really understand and really play back and reinforce and review all the key concepts in this text without having to reread it. And that is the culmination of what we're trying to do with the super learner method and what we're trying to get to become natural and second nature.